listening to Hidden Roll, the podcast where we introduce you to the brains behind your favorite toys, games, and all things play. Before we jump into this episode, we'd like to give special thanks to POP, peopleofplay.com, the one-stop hub for all toy and game inventors. Without them, this podcast would not be possible. You are listening to Hidden Roll, the podcast where we get to talk with the brains behind your favorite toys and games. I am artist, engineer, and game inventor David Yakos, And I'm Branson Faustini, a third-degree black belt in all things game design. <laughs> <laughs> there are lots of podcasts out there that talk about toy and game uh, reviews, news, and gameplay. But we want to dive in and talk to the people who actually make Toys and games. And I could not be happier again to, uh, to invite a friend on here, uh, Rory O'Connor, all the way from Northern Ireland. It's a pleasure. Hi, guys. Uh, hello. It's uh, you know, super thrilled to have you here. Uh, Rory, I've known you now for, gosh, it has to be you know, half of a decade, six, seven years, somewhere in there. Yeah, I think it's, oh yeah, it's actually, I think it's close to seven now. Seven years. I think yeah. we uh, may have first met either either at Hatch or Shy Tag, uh, which is now Pop People of Play. Uh, but I've had the pleasure of, of having you visit um, our place in Montana. And uh, one of the things I completely appreciate about you, you know, I've got, I've got four children and uh, you, know, you came for a couple of days. We went on a went on some hikes. We talked games. We played lots of games. Um, but our our guest room, which is now like an art room or our maker space, uh, you left after two nights of staying there, and our kids started calling that just Rory's room. <laughs> Somehow, <laughs> yeah, our, I've, I've, our our guest room just turned into Rory's room. What, what the heck? <laughs> I've no idea how that happened. I think. You had said before they were kind of a little bit starstruck because um, you had said, you know, Rory of Rory Story Keeps is coming to the house. So I think that kind of, I can only assume that got lodged in their head. I mean, the fact that we, you know, kind of got on the ground and, and played with the kids may have contributed, but I think they were already starstruck before I got there. It didn't really matter what I was going to, to do. <laughs> That's pretty funny. Yeah, years, just Rory's room. Whoever was staying there, oh yeah, you can stay in Rory's room. Yeah, no matter how many times you painted it or moved the furniture. Yeah, <clears throat> there's not even a bed in there anymore. It's still, yeah, Rory's room. So, uh, you know, you said getting on the floor and playing games with them. Let's let's rewind back to when you were a kid. What were you like as a as a kid? Like, imaginative, play play a lot of games. Yes, I spent a lot of time in my head you know and i've i suppose I've, I've kind of bunch of different memories that stick with me in in that regard um one is bizarrely like the, the idea of playing the fool so in the playground in school i would often make up games for us to play together and one of my earliest memories is of a game where i pretended to be like an ape or a gorilla and would make these sounds and chase after the kids and they'd be like ah! like running all over the place <clears throat> and i just chased after them as this gorilla um they seemed to be having fun but <laughs> you know but i think it was that thing of me actively kind of making a fool of myself for that for the kind of fun and entertainment um even though i'm incredibly shy and like um content to be on my own um and then also i think i played a lot with like action figures um, we didn't have a lot of money growing up so a lot of it was kind of like improvising with uh like using books to create forts and you know having half of it like a, a car track system and then having to improvise it with you know ramps and books and you know having cars slide down our stairway um <laughs> and and kind of playing i guess would also kind of tend to get me in trouble uh we used to play with the little plastic uh soldier kits you used to get you know where there'd be like 100 soldiers for you to play with and we would set up armies at the other either end of our hallway 
<laughs> and um, the the idea is you'd roll a marble to knock over your you know opponent's side. Not if you knock them all out, you win. My parents were away. Uh, I had older siblings, so they were kind of looking after the house, and I um, had three friends playing. So I was trying to pass the marble back to my first friend uh, whilst avoiding the army in the middle. Uh, oh no, my friend was doing it actually, and so he he lobbed the marble through the air, shattering uh, the um, the light basically that hung <laughs> over the person in the middle, causing it to collapse, and he just like. <laughs> kind of scarpered and, and ran home um <laughs> so yeah i think my play always kind of tended even though it was meant to be kind of normal would end up in these weird things happening when we were were playing it was never quite straightforward <laughs> having a having four kids i think that's kind of a normal experience you know you're not playing unless you break something right <laughs> yeah like 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 a, a a pool stick over my brother's back oh, <laughs> was one of them <laughs> so uh where where did you grow up um i grew up in like a small town out on the outskirts of dublin city uh it's called lucan um and uh, it's funny at the time like it was would have been considered kind of farmland so we actually had a farm kind of right close to us yet it was only nine nine twelve miles from the city center um but yeah so it was quite kind of Rural, I guess. Uh, that quickly changed, though, over time. Mm. And favorite uh, favorite games at the time, other than uh, you know, blasting army men with marbles. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's funny because I like. So my dad was a paper merchant. He sold paper to printers, and so we used to get games from. I think it was MB Games. Um, like every Christmas, we get a gift. But I don't actually have strong memories of those games. Um, for me, one of the kind of this was big games I got was actually a book, and it, it was um, one Christmas we'd watched *The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe*, the animated movie mm -hmm. uh, on TV. Probably, I think looking at the timing, I think it was like 1981, uh, maybe 82. And I kind of fell in love with that that setting. And my brother was going into town and I said, you know, using my Christmas money, will you please buy me one of the books from that series? And he came home and said, oh, I couldn't find that, but I found this instead. And it was The Warlock of Firetop Mountain by Steve Jackson and Ian Livingstone. And I remember being furious at the time going, that wasn't what I asked for. I wanted this book, you know. <laughs> I, tended, I tended to have like... Uh, I'd either be like kind of really happy or I'd fly into rage. I just, I couldn't control my emotions when I was younger. Um, but then we actually sat down and played it. So it was like the first kind of fantasy choose your own adventure where you'd kind of like turn to a page, read a section. Uh, it would give you decisions to make and you'd roll a dice for the outcome. And, you know, in this game, you were searching through a, a dungeon. And I have really nice memories of sitting with my two older brothers, um, where one of us was reading the book and the narrative, the other person was drawing the map, and the other person was like controlling the combat and rolling the dice. And so even this is like meant to be a solo experience, the three of us sat down together and and played that together. And I think that really uh I ha I had been making um like casting metal figures. Um, so yeah, for the kids out there, we used to make figures out of lead that we were allowed to melt on our like stove top. <laughs> Your um, kids, here's a pile of lead. Go melt yeah, it. Yeah, <laughs> literally, you'd find like a little block of lead and melt it and cast it into these figures. There was a company in uh, Cork, Prince August. I didn't realize there were an Irish company it used to make molds for people to kind of make cast their own figures. Um, so whilst my brother was doing Napoleonics and a lot of historical stuff, I was casting skeletons and goblins and orcs <laughs> so the warlock of firetop mountain i think kind of cemented my love of like fantasy as a, a genre that's awesome those adventure books are they're cool <laughs> i was so proud like i got so many friends into those books when we were younger which which broadened my library because like i said we didn't have much money so 
the wealthier kids would buy the books and I'd borrow them from them. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, how did you go from uh, a kid uh, to a uh, successful inventor? What was the journey? Um, well, I think I've primarily been interested in trying to get people to think differently. So, I kind of throw out a couple of things and explain how I got to that point. So, that's kind of one thing. Um, so I'd always have seen myself more of a as a change agent than rather than a game designer. Um and then like when myself and Anita would talk about what we do, we would kind of see say we're kind of like artists, but our medium is like paper and cardboard rather than like a canvas that the things we're trying to create is we're using that medium of material and play um, to express our ideas and, and thoughts to others. Um, so probably like a big thing growing up, um, I was studying computer animation um, in uh, kind of college. Um, and during that year, a school friend of mine committed suicide and he had left a message saying, um, I can't see a way out of this. And I remember thinking at that time, I don't ever want to get to that point in my life. Um, and so all these weird things were happening, like happened at the same time where I was becoming more interested in like puppetry as an almost like real time animation versus like computer animation. Um, and I felt it would give me kind of an opportunity to travel. And so I think going down that having experienced that kind of pain, I guess, and how someone could experience that pain. It's really kind of shaped who I was a lot in terms of what I wanted to, to do in the world um, and not kind of settle really. So I was involved a lot in things like community arts, um, uh, street theater, um, educational multimedia as well. And then kind of came back to, uh, I spent a time away in Vancouver uh, and eventually came back to, to Northern Ireland and started working in, in a cross community project teaching multimedia. But as part of that, I needed to learn, I wanted to learn about um, different learning styles and accelerated learning techniques because I had discovered that when I was doing educational multimedia, where I kind of found my learning style was visual and kinesthetic. And I was like, why did nobody tell me this when I was in school? Like, it would have made <laughs> such a difference. Um, and so I became really interested in kind of helping people to access and use their own creativity more. Um, I had a really interesting, <laughs> I was doing kind of coaching, tr coaching training at the time. Uh, life coaching was really big in like 2003, 2004. And as part of that mentoring, I was saying to uh, my kind of life coach at the time, I'm really torn because uh, uh, whether to like focus on the kind of creativity techniques to help people with kind of, you know, getting unstuck and problem solving or using the kind of life coaching techniques. And he kind of said, well, you know, um, you kind of need to make a decision but between one or the other. And it was funny. I went, great, thanks. <laughs> I need to focus on the creativity <laughs> side of things. Um, and because I kind of felt I was much more, um, I could speak from a place of experience with that and really stand by it rather than pretending to be something. I was like, no, I use these creativity techniques. Uh, they help me. And so by using those creativity techniques, like one of the things I had been taught um, by Wynne Wenger, who's got an amazing body of work out there. Um, he passed away, unfortunately, in February. Um, he used to say the best thing you can do with creative problem solving techniques is use them to create even better creative problem solving techniques. And so I actually use one of the methods, um, which he calls, um, which one was he using? Beachhead, uh, which is an invention technique. <clears throat> and I use that to um, invent, kind of by accident, very story cubes. Uh, I'm going to cough for a second, hang on. <laughs> um, so at this time I had been 
doing kind of creativity coaching and training with people. And I had created something called the Inner Vision Deck, which is a tool to help people get unstuck. Uh, but it looked really pragmatic, but it was a playful kind of uh, deck of cards. And so then, so Rory Strictives didn't kind of come out of the blue. I was already doing this coaching work, but I was trying to come up with a creative problem solving tool. And uh, using this visualization technique, I literally saw Rory Story Cubes in its original form. And what was quite funny, I will kind of tell you a story about this. So this technique is, um, it's about kind of tricking your subconscious. So you set an intention and you distract your subconscious long enough for it to kind of like present something to you. And the way you do this is, in your mind's eye, you set an intention that you're going to travel somewhere to discover something. And you kind of broadly describe what it is you're trying to discover, like the problem you're trying to solve. So in my case, it was, I want to find, you know, I had a shopping list. Well, it's like creative thinking tool, maybe a game, um, something that might help with uh, healing because I was interested in energy psychology as well. You know, dealing with kind of uh, beliefs and blocks that people might experience. Um, and so you do this technique where you close your eyes and you start to visualize by describing the back of your hand and you're drawing out your own insight and awareness by talking to either a partner who's listening or like a recording device. Um, but what you find is the more you describe, the more you see to describe, the more you keep describing and the more it all becomes real. Um, so you describe um, a lift arriving, stepping into the lift, setting the intention that this lift is going to take you somewhere to find this discovery you describe the physical experience of traveling in this lift. So you're, it, it's like a full body kind of experience. You arrive at a location, you start by looking at your feet. Again, you're like constantly saying to your subconscious, like or your, yeah, your conscious, look over here, look over here. So your subconscious can be setting something up. Um, so I got out and I had actually arrived back at a place that I had been in a previous exercise where I did this. I was like, well, that's kind of weird. I went over that way to discover a game before. I'm going to head this direction instead. So I kind of traveled on and actually on these really cool um, bipedal mechanical dev devices that were like an ostrich, but they were kind of like powered by the <laughs> rider. An engineer told me they were physically impossible, but I was like, mm, I still think these could exist. <laughs> um, <laughs> Engineers but, are the worst. <laughs> yeah. Um, they so we basically traveled across this desert and we found this um kind of wise man meditating and he had a rubik's cube in his lap with icons on it and i and i looked at it and I went um oh that's really interesting but it's probably my conscious mind getting in the way because i had just read a book um called harebrain tortoise mind and it had mentioned how children could solve the Rubik's cube using pattern matching. So they weren't, you know, they're not logically solving it. They're just sensing the pattern and uh, being able to solve it that way. So I went, oh, it's not it. I'm going to keep going. So in my mind's eye, I traveled further and I came to this building that had a big sign on and I called it the Department of Good Ideas. <laughs> I was like, yeah, this is where I need to go. <laughs> um, so if you, if you picture me, for anyone looking at me, I'm just lying back with my eyes closed in a chair talking to uh, my mini disc. <coughs> That's, it was like 2000, 2004. Um, it, talking out loud and saying what I'm seeing to this thing. In my mind's eye, I'm in this kind of dusty plane uh, where there's this big kind of gray building and this kind of big sign saying the Department of Good Ideas. And I walk to the door and the receptionist says, um, oh yeah, they're waiting for you. And, and points me to another doorway. So I go through this door and kind of like shh, shh, walk in and I see three children in um, lab coats. And I'm like, mm, okay, I'm in the right spot because for me, children explain things really plainly. Um, and it's quite easy to kind of get half information when you're doing this uh, kind of visualization technique. And they said, oh, this is the thing you're looking for. And an iris opened in the countertop and up came that exact same Rubik's cube with all the icons on it. <laughs> I was like, okay, this is the thing I meant to discover. So my subconscious literally twice went, this is the thing you have to see. Like, no, 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 this is the thing you have to see. So I asked them how it worked and they said, well, it's a creative problem solving tool. You think of a question you're trying to answer, 
you mix up the the cube um, and you take one of the sides, which has nine images on it, and you use that to tell a story, and that story is like a metaphor for the problem you're trying to solve. So I immediately opened my eyes. Well, I thank them, do the whole process of kind of leaving. You debrief yourself, um, recording the information, and then I just jotted down everything I could remember from that. And what was really funny, actually, was that I was really excited about this thing, and I ran down to Anita, and we had just had our first child, Neve. Um, and I ran into the kitchen. I was like, Nina, I've just had this like amazing idea. And I started to describe it. And she went, just prototype it. Because <laughs> like, <laughs> like, she was so tired from sleepless nights. And I was like, OK, fair enough. So I went out and bought a Rubik's Cube. And over a coffee one day, we sat down and kind of generated ideas for what the um, icons might be. And then I used, uh, I don't know, say this often to people, but I used kinesiology as a way of picking the icons. So muscle testing as a way of picking what icons should go in which position um, on that original Rubik's Cube. Um, and so that's the uh, original form was a Rubik's Cube with um, stickers. Um, and yeah, I used to, I just started using it and it was great. Uh, worked really well. Um, I was doing kind of uh, like uh, coaching mornings and creativity mornings with those people and they'd want to buy one. So I'd hand make them and sell them to them. You know, and I thought, ah, oh, you know, maybe I'll sell a hundred. And then it was like, maybe I'll sell a thousand. Maybe I'll sell, if I'm really lucky, 10,000. But I was like, oh, um, are there that many coaches in the world who would want to use this thing? Um, and then what started happening was that other people were telling me stories of how families were using this and teachers and um, how they were spending like three hours sitting down together, sorry, two hours, yeah, sitting in like a hotel lobby telling stories across three generations. And I was like, okay, there's something going on here with this thing that I haven't quite fully grasped before. Um, and yeah, we looked at, kind of on the back of that, we looked at, at essentially licensing it to the company who had the rights for Rubik's Cube. And their reply was like, mm, we don't really get it. Um, so, but we'd seen how people were reacting to it. So like, we have to make this thing because we're seeing the experience that people are having and, and what they're talking about. Um, and so we changed it from kind of Rubik's Cube to nine dice. And we, we've we realized we kind of... Um, like unlocked this other potential that hadn't been there before in terms of like the sound, the kinesthetic aspect was amplified. Um, and obviously it opened the opportunity for kind of mixing sets together. Sorry, that's a long way to answer how that's, I got into gaming. Yeah, yeah but it's a, it's a beautiful story. Uh, you know, growing up, it, growing up in the 80s, you know, in a time where, you know, they weren't recognizing necessarily like, like dyslexia and different things like that, that are just different learning styles. And realizing you're a kinesthetic uh, visual learner that recognized these these uh, needs or desires to learn kinesthetically, um, and became a change agent. Like you're not necessarily a game inventor or experience inventor, but you're a, an agent of change. Uh, but one of the things I'm picking up here, and your story speaks of it, is the power of imagination. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, that's where 100% of our ideas come from, our imagination. And you talk to any five, eight-year-old, and, you know, they pick up something. They can describe a world that you cannot see. They can describe, you know, a device or an invention made out of a couple of Lego blocks. Uh, there's something about your intentionality in this that continues to, to push that type of... Uh, read of imagination with kids can you expound on that a little bit like with story cubes maybe even describe for those listeners that have haven't had the privilege of playing of like what does that experience look like when they pick up these nine magical dice yeah so so um story cubes is a set of um nine dice um i have a few here because i was playing a game I've got my uh, I've got my autographed yeah. Doctor Who set right here as well, which is <laughs> near mint, but it uh, 
I think flying back home after I got it autographed, I shoved it in my oh, okay. pocket. <laughs> um, so this is kind of one from the original set, um, and it's uh, Rose Three Cubes instead of nine dice. Um, each dice has a unique image or icon on it. And um, so there's 54 unique images in each set. Um, and to play the game, you would kind of shake the nine dice and roll them out. And you begin to tell a story that begins with Once Upon a Time and has to somehow link together all nine face-up images. Um, so, for example, describing these here, it might be um, if I'd rolled them out, uh, say, uh, one morning, um, long ago, there was uh, an old man um, sleeping. He'd fallen asleep. No, it was a guard, actually, who'd fallen asleep um, on guard duty in the kingdom of Fazel. Um, and that image for the listeners was like, looked like some Z's coming off of a... Yeah, it's like someone sleeping. But the icon can kind of mean anything as long as you can make it an association to it. And I'll come back to that in a minute. So maybe this was another icon that captures my Im imagination or captures my eye and it's like a kind of could be a wand. Um, so it might be when the guard is sleeping, uh, a wizard by the name of Dorcas the Great uh, comes up and decides to transform, you know, the sleeping guard into a mouse so that they can sneak past. Sorry, I'm in the middle of playing a a solo game of D D at the moment, so it's all kind of fantasy stuff in my head. Um, <laughs> but, but but you can see the the kind of the magic is that I might look at those icons and see those things, and I'll also see them because it's right now when I'm looking at it. Um, if I looked at them like yesterday or tomorrow, I'll make different associations. And likewise, when you look at them, you'll see something different as well. And so. Whilst the game is quite simple, you roll the cubes and, and make a story, there's a whole lot of stuff, I think, going on with the experience that you're you're having. And it's kind of been reinforced time and again with, you know, the, the now millions of people who've played it. One of the really interesting things is we all have our own different, uh, we see different things when we look at the cubes. And initially... You know, and it tells us a lot about our culture. Like initially, sometimes people want to correct other people when they say, oh, this is what it, you know, they'll make a statement. This is what it is. So they'll make a statement as to what the thing is. And someone else will say, no, 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 it's this. And so you can have a conversation with them to open them up to the possibility that actually you're both, you're both seeing something, but yet it's not the thing either, <laughs> you, you know, <laughs> um, and it can be multiple other things. And so actually what would happen quite a lot is we would get emails from teachers who want to use Roy Story Cubes in the classroom with younger kids. And they're like, mm, but I'm reluctant to use them because um, I'd really like a list of the meanings of the icons. And I'd have to keep saying to them, there is no definitive list for the icons. I can tell you what I was thinking when I created them, but that's not what they represent because a picture of an apple could be um an orchard it could be going to see a doctor for your kind of like an apple a day it could be william tell it, like it's all about context and so that's kind of like the other part of playing with story cubes is you know constantly saying to people just there is no right and wrong in this it's about trusting your own interpretation of what it is you're seeing because you know we'd say in life people are kind of looking for this guidance as to, am I doing it right? Am I doing it wrong? And life doesn't give you that feedback. Um, so you kind of have to learn to acknowledge what you're seeing or thinking yourself and be willing to kind of stand by that decision as well. And so I kind of like to think of story cubes as giving people that safe training to learn to pay attention to those images and thoughts that are coming up for them without looking for external validation as to whether it's good or bad or right or wrong. It's really quite remarkable. Uh, I, I feel like outside of like a uh, tabletop role-playing games, I haven't, I, you know, there's not too much out there like that. The sort of open-ended uh, uh, play experience where people get to actually 
uh, open up and use their imagination. Um, not uh, yeah, I think not in the way that Story Cubes does it, which is. I think, you know, being a product designer like yourselves, you've probably seen it where uh, sometimes I think toy manufacturers try to corral people in a certain way. Um, be creative like this, you know, and it's like, well, I'm not being creative. I'm just like filling in the blanks that you've left for me to, to play with. Whereas the kind of exciting and the scary thing with Rory Story Cubes is it's like, here's like seeds for you to, to play with let's see what they all turn into when when you play with them and what's really interesting is like children have no problem playing with rory story cubes um adults quite often have a problem and i'll tell you a quick story about that um <laughs> and but also it works cross generationally so again one of the incredible things that i've seen happen is this like multi-generational players sitting down together and sharing experiences and the older generation looking at kids going, oh my God, I didn't realize that like that was going on for that child because like things leak through, um, you know, and they talk about the things that are important to them because there's a slightly like, there can be a slightly kind of therapeutic aspect to playing with story cubes. Um, I, I kind of read this, uh, a book, it was about, by a, a therapist, but it was talking about dream therapy and how he kind of said, um, you can't help but tell a story about what's going on for you right now mm. so even if you talk choose to talk about the weather the way you talk about that is saying something about your current state and how you're feeling um and so that kind of links people together and younger people get to hear like maybe their grandparents tell stories about their childhood and their past because they'll see an icon and it'll remind them of a time when something you know happened and they'll share that story as well and that's always really incredible to see um, but when people say they can't tell a story or I have no imagination, I'd, I'd say kind of two, there's two things I'd say to them. Well, one is like, have you ever lied in your life? And I go, <laughs> well, because when you did, you made up a story <laughs> <laughs> and they're like, darn it. Um, and then the other one I'd say to them is, um, do you remember when you were like a, a child and you were maybe running down a hill and you were running so fast, you had to keep running because if you didn't, you'd fall over. And they're like, yeah, I remember that. And, I, and I'd say, that's how you play Rory Story Cubes. And so I'd get them to do it where, because sometimes they try and plan out the story to tell like the best story. And then I'd go, okay, try this approach. And said, just look for the first symbol that grabs your attention, start talking until you see another symbol that grabs your attention, and then like jump to that one. So treat them like stepping stones. And what would invariably happen is at some point, the way I describe it is that they stop, they stop telling the story and the story starts telling through them, <laughs> you know, because just the momentum shifts and you can feel like, oh my, they're, they're now trying to keep up with the story that just wants to come out as, as well. Um, and it's incredible. Like it, it rarely fails. Like when you take that approach and they always prefer that approach to storytelling. Like when I say, well, which method do you prefer best? And they're like, mm, I much prefer that one. And that's yeah. what I guess a lot of creativity is, you know, we are inherently creative. The difference is the, vo the kind of voice of the judgments that we've put in place, uh, that, we think are needed for us to kind of, you know, exist or function in society or in our family unit. Um, and it's the one that's telling us, no, that's, no, that's dumb. Don't say that. Or, you know, you look bad if you do that, or people will laugh at you at you do that. And essentially what you're trying to do is sneak past that, you know, or run so fast that it's, it's running after you going, no way, they're going to laugh at you. And you're going, I don't care. <laughs> well, that's That's got to be how, you know, when you talk about, Kids are often better at this than adults. I, I feel that the world sort of beats our creativity, or at least our permission to be creative and imaginative out of us by saying that's childish. That's, that's you know, grow up. That's silly. You know, that, that could never happen. You could never ride an ostrich bike around. You know, whatever it is that mm -hmm. uh, there, there's people check, but, check out their creativity. But I think you have to understand, like, so I, I guess I used to have a 
point where it's like, yeah, you know, those people, they're doing this thing to us, you know, and they're beating that creativity out of us. And this is the longer I've lived or kind of looked at things. I look at, we exist in like the dominant value system at the moment is kind of, you know, we're, it's the kind of rational world that kind of comes from the industrial revolution uh, where it's all about measurement, quantification, you know, or some would say the kind of re uh, renaissance, but it's that kind of industrial revolution where it's about measuring and quantifying everything. And does, ev does it have purpose or value that can be measured and quantified? And the unfortunate thing is creativity often doesn't because you're like, well, I don't know if it's going to pay off or not. Um, and so people aren't willing to invest in that. And so for, I guess, you know, parents with their children, if a child was showing that and they want them to get work, they're going to go, mm, no, no, like concentrate on your reading and your maths and stuff like that. Cause you know, you'll get, you'll get work in the work, you know, in the factory doing that kind of stuff. And I think it's just over time, then that's kind of like each generation has grown up with someone trying to protect them by telling them to do this. And they've forgotten why they're telling them to do this. So at a point, so we're at a point now where we're like, no, the world has gotten so complex. We actually need that ability to make these creative links and synergies because you, you can't make lists to work this stuff out. You have to like, spot connections and sense things but we spent the last couple of generations trying to protect people and now we're at a point where it's like oh so we've kind of lost the means to do the thing that we need to do to get us out of this new situation that that old way of thinking created you know and that was i think einstein who used to say you know you can't solve today's problems by by the same thinking that created it um so i i don't think it's a, a malicious thing that's been done. It's quite often done with the intent to seemingly protect the person, but it doesn't necessarily um, help in the long term. Mm -hmm. sure. I think a level of competitiveness in society kind of plays into that as well. I feel like um, a lot of times, uh, you know, I, you mentioned Dungeons and Dragons. When I when I introduce mm -hmm. the game to new players, uh, not everybody does this, but so, some players uh, almost feel like they have to win mm -hmm. the game. And when something, when they, when they roll badly and it's just, oh, you know, something bad happens, it's it's tragic to them. They feel like they've ruined, it's ruined the game experience when it's really just yeah. a stepping stone to the next cool thing that's going to mm -hmm. happen. But they're trying to win the game. And um, uh, yeah, I think. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. No, like I, I do think in in life, a lot of stuff has um, been kind of presented in that way, um, and it, you know, it, and it's unfortunate because it's very hard to kind of shift gears when you're told everything is kind of doggy dog, or you know, the smartest will come out on top. Um, because we're kind of at a point now in life where we actually need, you can still have it all, but the, the, the kind of new little twist to it is, but not at the expense of others. So it's like, so you, yes, you can have a quality of life, but not if it means that someone else is kind of uh, suffering or losing out. And, and that's, you know, a growing thought process in terms of kind of, you know, climate, the environment, um, inequalities in life as well. Whereas previously it would have been like, ah, oh, no, it's their fault. <laughs> you know, this notion of somehow I worked hard and I earned this. So therefore you probably weren't smart enough or didn't work hard enough to get it. Um, and, and that's kind of, again, this was a realization with, um, story cubes, you know, it, it became hugely, um, successful, um, you know, and described as, as a kind of, you know, one of those like once in a <clears throat> lifetime or generation, uh, toys to really break out. But when I look back, I go like, I know lots of people who work really hard and have amazing ideas. So why is it that story cubes took off? Because, and it, and it's very, it would be very easy to look back and create a narrative that like, like made it inev inevitable for us to be successful because of all of the choices we made. And I just can't do that. Like, mm. 
you know, I, I see people around me who are kind of on the breadline and, you know, I'm like, they work really hard. Like, so do I say I work harder than them? I don't think so. Um, so what is it? And it's, you know, there's certain things where we took risks that paid off, but we, we, but again, we took risks where we were always able to, or willing to take the consequences of it. Um, and uh, that's something that might kind of come back to that idea of like putting it all on the line. Um, but also we, we described it as like, we sowed seeds for luck to happen. So we couldn't define which thing was going to pay off, but we would constantly be doing things that were like, mm, this might work out or this might work out or this might work out. Um, we just never knew which one would, we just kept doing it. Um, and I think, and, and they were for each one, like you couldn't look at it and go, here's our strategy. We're going to sow these seeds everywhere <laughs> for this stuff to happen, you know, and then we'll be successful. It was still like, hmm. Um, the, the phrase uh, I would use a lot is like, what is being called for right now? So it's not like, like, what do I want to have happen? But what is life calling for to have, you know, that we're meant to kind of help make happen? And that would kind of get us to, do things where I might be too shy to do, you know, beforehand and, you know, go on a radio interview where someone hears it and they get in contact. Or um, I think I was telling you like previously where on a, a flight to New York, uh, we learned that the Irish president was on the same flight and we kind of engineered a way to, to get Michael D. Higgins, um, who is much loved by everybody, I have to say, um, he's like the philosopher president um we <laughs> managed to get a set of story cubes to him and we got a really nice letter back thanking us and you know in return like a year or two later we got a request to buy story cubes to give to um you know children from lower income areas so that idea of you know our whole goal was to get story cubes out into the world and money was always a fuel like that was a really crucial thing. It was because it was really funny. People would go, well, how successful is Roy Story Cubes? And we'd say, well, we've sold a million units. And they're like, yeah, well, how much have you made? <laughs> and I, <laughs> well, enough. But we got a hundred a million units out there. And if you calculate that roughly four people play with a set of Story Cubes, that's four million people playing with Story Cubes. <laughs> they're like, yeah, but how much have you made? Um, <laughs> and, but that's always what drove us was that kind of, um, desire for impact, I guess, and, and trusting that money would fuel that uh, to enable us to keep doing that. Well, I guess when you when you attack game development uh, uh, with the mindset of being a change agent, uh, you know, the intentionality behind every icon uh, around your price point, you know, around uh, just the open ended play with just enough seed for that creativity, but that that all comes into play. And who would have thought that that much intentionality goes behind, you know, behind one die, behind one cube. Uh, brilliant. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think we've we've kind of talked before about um, in designing the icons for for Rory Story Cubes, um, the ones that get picked are always the ones that could have multiple meanings, because to me, it's like you're giving more value for money within that that little <laughs> box. Um, you know, and like you said, we kind of, we priced it at a, a point where it would be affordable to people, uh, no matter what their income level was, because again, it was about getting it out to people. And, uh, but it was really interesting in terms of trying to solve the, the model at the time for like toys is put it in a big box, you know, because it's often being gifted. So it look, has to look like a high value product. Um, and the contradiction we were trying to deal with was, but we know people put it in their pocket afterwards. So how do we design a game that has, and so the, the distributors that we would work with, you know, their, their notion was it needs to create value. So therefore put it in their bigger box. It was that like one solution to the problem. But when we, we said, well, what are, what's the problem they're trying to solve? And we realized it was that idea of creating value, perceived value for the, the product. We actually looked at cosmetics because we're like, they're all in small boxes. They charge a fortune for what they do. You know, what can we learn from that? Um, and so if you look at it, the packaging of Rory Story Cubes, 
it's very similar to cosmetics where um, it's kind of got a luxury feel to it, even though it's small and compact. So you think, hmm, this is kind of worth a lot. Um, and, and the other interesting thing is that dice are considered as components. So they're just like a side thing for a game. And the amount of times when we were talking to like either factories or retailers and we we're saying, no, oh, each one of these is a piece of art. Like it is the game. And it was really hard for them to get their head around that because they'd say, oh yeah, we can make dice. And but because they weren't a main component, they didn't really put a ten, you know, intention into what they were doing. <laughs> um, and we tried some crazy because we keep going back saying, no, like you need to tweak this and and change this. Um, and I think that was quite significant, like what we created with Story Cubes as the dice suddenly being really, really important as part of the game. No, I don't think anyone had really done that before. Nice. Well, uh, your newest games, uh, mm -hmm. Prisma Arena, um, a topic that's really important to me. Uh, it's been described as a, a really good model for um, inclusivity in uh, game design. Mm -hmm. um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about Prisma Arena, what it is, and kind of your uh, your thought process behind it. Yeah, so, um, I mean, and I'll start by giving a, a shout out to uh, Meeple Like Us, which is a review site um, who reviews games for accessibility, both economic and, you know, uh, site uh, as well. Um, and they were the ones who basically said it was kind of one of the most inclusive games that they ever encountered. Um, so the game itself is just a really fast, fun arena combat game. Like mechanically, that's what it is. Um, it's kind of spatial combat and it's portrayed in this kind of cartoonish um, that looks like a cross between kind of Steven Universe and Pokemon and uh, Avatar The Last Airbender. Th that was the kind of vibe we were going for. Um, and so, again, the intention was myself and my co-designer, John Fury, um, we love those kind of games. We, we like the spatial aspect, so th there's that thing coming up again, um, and the kinesthetic aspect of moving things around. And But we thought a lot of the games that we were seeing were quite dark and grungy, and it was like, you know, fight the demon overlord, or, you know, you know kill your enemy. <laughs> and we were like, th these are for older dudes. You know, and we wanted to create a game. Um, well, John was actually trying to find a use for his hero clicks figures that he had <laughs> gathered up over the years um, and had no one to play with. So he wanted to kind of make a way of reusing them. And I said, well, okay, I'm going to challenge you a little bit more. I want to create a game that, can, that two children can play together and really enjoy, that a child and a parent can play together and really enjoy, and two adults who are fans of these games can play it together and enjoy. And he was like, okay. Um, and so that's what we set about doing. And so we designed an arena combat game where, um, so the concept of the game is that you're young novices training to become guardians of hope in a time of despair. Um, and so all of like the way all this came together was like, okay, you're going to be heroes. You're kind of fighting for something. What are you fighting for? And it was like oh, the, the darkness. And I was like going, oh, it's been done so many times. You know, what can I bring to this that hasn't really been done? And I thought, well, let's move away from the binary of black and white and good and evil, first of all. And if we can kind of convey that to younger players, I think that would be something positive. So we started this idea of cycles, like in time and civilization go through cycles. Um, and, you know, this was um, during a certain kind of political period in the US a few years ago, where uh, a lot of people were in a state of despair. You know, it doesn't really matter what their political background was. Um, and so the idea was that um, it was a time of despair. And despair was this like giant creature who walked the land and, and kind of you know, spread despair through anyone it touched. But at the same time, hope was sleeping. And it was inevitable that hope was going to awaken. It's just a matter of when. So the heroes were going to become guardians of hope, protecting it until it awoken, awoke. Um, but it wasn't just binary. So I introduced the idea of 
the, the almost like seasons. So after the time of hope, which is like spring, you've got the time of wonder, which is the time of innovation and breakthroughs and you know all of these things. And then apathy, when people become complacent with all of this incredible stuff that they've achieved. And then they slip back into a time of despair. So the idea was that it would go through these seasons. Um, so yeah, our heroes were going to become guardians of, of hope. Um, and there's something that's always kind of stuck with me, this idea of us having this kind of inner light um, that kind of charges us or, or powers us um, and kind of gets us out of bed to do things or, or make a difference in the world. So in the game, I had this idea of Prisma, like you are channeling your inner light um, and that's what enables you to do like laser blasts and, and things like that in the arena. Um, and on top of that, then your joy, I wanted to have cute creatures because who doesn't love a game where you have like cute sidekicks with you? So again, the question was, well, what are they going to be? And I'd seen enough games where they made up characters, but there was no real reason for them. And so you'd be going, what does that, what does that character do again? Like what's their ability? And I decided to connected to um, emotions so that you're almost like summoning your emotions and you had to learn to work with them. And again, it, it kind of was inspired by community work in the past of trying to make people more aware of what emotions they had and the, and the resources they have available. Um, so in this game, like anger uh, can help you so that like when um, Farg, which is the name of the, the character, when Farg gets bounced from the arena, so if you think like laser tag, when they reach their limit, they get bounced. Um, your hero can do like a free attack. So they lash out is the ability and they can lash out. But if there isn't a, uh, a rival target there, they're going to hit one of their friendly targets. So you have to make sure you time it right. Um, and likewise, um, jealousy is one of my favorite. Um, Grova, oh, New Hook, sorry. And they covet. Um, so when I look, when I looked into the emotion of jealousy, it's kind of telling you that if there's something you aspire to or that you 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 want, um, and it can drive us to do better things when when we see that it's if we channel it in the right direction. And so Newhawk has this ability where they can essentially take a card that another player has played and play it back against them. Um, so it's this kind of really fun thing of they co they copy the cool move that they did and they get to perform it back. Um, so there's all these things going on with this really cool combo system that allows for that kind of over-the-top play. Um, so that's kind of like a bit of the mechanic in the world. But when it came to some of the components, um, I wanted this to create a game, you know, being inspired by the likes of um, Steven Universe. Um, we're trying to figure out, could we do a way where we people could see themselves in the game? Because traditionally in, in these games, um, you would people would say, oh yeah, we're you know we're being inclusive. We've got a female character who's generally Hispanic or you know Mediterranean and you know very hypersexualized and like a thief character because they're lithe. Or you have the big black bruiser guy, you know, and they've got a lot of strength. And so one thing we did was we separated abilities from the characters. So each character you play can have any kind of powers they choose to acquire as they play. Um, but again, due to, we were thinking of doing miniatures for the game, but because of the cost that would involve, it would have shifted it out of the price range of the family audience we wanted to, to reach. And again, that kind of medium to low income family who we would hope would really enjoy this kind of game experience. Um, so we said, okay, we can't do miniatures because that like a Kickstarter type thing and I don't want to be charging you know $150 for this game or $100 um, so we said okay we'll use standees which is kind of like on Kickstarter is a big no-no like you're not going to be successful on Kickstarter if you have standees but we went well that's not our audience um, but what could we do with standees that you so cardboard kind of cutouts that you couldn't do with um, plastic figures and uh, myself and uh, my colleague were talking and thinking about um, games where you get to kind of like customize your, your character and your appearance. So we decided to uh, create, allow players to customize their character with stickers. Um, so essentially the character you get is a template and is kind of gender neutral. So you can design that character um, to give them 
a more masculine appearance, non-binary appearance. Um, and again, the, the, even the, the way we do the uniforms, they're kind of quite um, Eastern in that there's trousers, but you can wear a skirt over them. Or you could just have like have the skirt without the trousers because the stickers are all designed to be layered on top of each other. So the idea is that you can really represent yourself in the game. And we worked closely with people from kind of different backgrounds to get their input on the designs to make sure that they really represented. So when so when a child or an adult looked at it, they were like, yeah, you know, I recognize that from my heritage or my culture as well. It was a lot of work, but it's really satisfying to see it in play and see people get excited by their their heroes with uh with that playing like you were talking earlier about story cubes and there being almost like a a hidden um, therapeutic aspect of it where the story the true story is going to come out um and like people are going to be able to share their emotions uh in in Prism Arena, like this is more than just like a you're not getting in and it's not like a blaster game where you go in and just shoot each other in an arena. Uh, with the emotions tied in, have you come across some examples uh, or some story with you know playing this with kids or mm. games you've watched where people have, I guess, unlocked different things about themselves, uh, you know, emotional health, like. What, uh, what types of things have you experienced in actual play? Well, I think, I mean, on a, on a very kind of minimal level, I think people, it gets people to think twice about how they perceive emotions of, they can go, oh yeah, that one can be quite helpful. Um, or, you know, that they're uh, sometimes more drawn to one emotion over the other. And But again, within the game, to really, the last stage of leveling up because um, over the course of the game, you're trying to level up um, to become a guardian. You have to have played with all of the emotions. So the idea is you have to kind of have mastered your emotions and learned how to work with them. Um, but there's one story in particular where um, my <clears throat> co-designer was playing play testing with his nephew. And as part of when he was playing it, they were playing with um, Donna, who represents emotion. Um, and when he kind of randomly drew this card, he said, oh, I don't, um, you know, my dad doesn't think I'm confident. And so it opened up this conversation about, well, what it means to have, you know, confidence in different areas of life. And, um, I've heard similar things, you know, from other people talking about it in that way as well. Um, so it's, it, you know, it might not always be an overt thing, but the fact that it's being there and again, it's like, I find the best stuff in play and in games is it's, it's not the stuff that's pushed to the front. It's the stuff that's kind of like embedded into the game is where you have the most impact. Um, if you're tra drawing your attention to, this is all about emotion, people wouldn't want to play it. They're like, oh, you're trying to do something to me. Uh, whereas the fact it's like, oh, by the way, these creatures represent different emotions. People are like, oh, that's cool, you know, and they're they're cute. Um, and I have to say, actually, so all of the names of the emotions are the Irish or Gaelic um, spelling for, for that emotion. I've just anglicized them uh, phonetically. Uh, so it's been really cool seeing kind of native speakers look at Farg and go, ah, <laughs> they, you know, they just know what it is. They don't. They don't need to be told that it represents anger. Awesome. <laughs> I think that's a, such a good, such a good tool, and the intentionality behind you know, anger. You know, the last one you mentioned there, like that. That can be um, used to to strengthen you. There's there's places for it, and mm -hmm. the, the fact that if you unleash it when. Uh, at the inappropriate time, there's going to be some friendly fire <laughs> like that. Yeah. That's it. Well, like, I think we've been taught a lot that, you know, anger is a bad thing. You know, I definitely had grown up with that concept in my head. And that had kind of, you know, you just have to push it down. And so I've spent a lot of time trying to get used to the fact of, you no, know, it can actually be helpful, you know, and especially in this idea of like fighting for hope. Um, again, I guess, you know, one of the ideas behind that is, Hope isn't something you passively sit around and wait to happen. Like the whole idea of the game is like you fight for hope. 
um, and you're protecting it until the right time, but you're also, the idea is hope is reacting to your prisma, your prisma, um, because as you train, you level up, and as you level up, your prisma gets stronger, and in response, hope awakens, and then hope starts to give you, that's how you start getting your powers, you're like unlocking your, your powers. And I have to, I think, you know, I told you another time, but I wanted to tell you that story of um, talking with my daughter, because again, like an intentional aspect of this game is that you are sparring with each other. And we didn't want the idea of um, you kind of killing, right? That, that wasn't what the game was about. Um, and so we said, well, you're fighting with your Prisma. It's kind of like uh, laser tag. You're, you're dealing hits to each other, and when you deal enough hits, you get bounced from the arena. It's like you teleport out, but you reset and you come back in the next round. And when I was telling my daughter, who was 10 at the time, about this, um, she said, oh, so you're not trying to kill each other. You're trying to make each other stronger. And I was like, literally I went, no white dude designing a, an arena combat game is ever going to think of that. <laughs> and so I went, that's exactly what this is about. And, you know, I, I kind of said about it, it basically informed everything we did after that point. Um, so even when you play and you train, so the, the goal is you get to like 20 points when you're training. And if you get 20 points, you get like one point. If you get above 21 points, you get two, you get two training points. Traditionally, it would be the winner who would get the extra point. And I was like, no, no, no. If both players get over 20, they both get the point because you're trying to make each other stronger. And even in that, it's like, traditionally, the the, lo the losing player might say, well, I forfeit the game because there's no point to me playing. Whereas the mechanism we have means, no, no, you want to keep fighting right until the last minute because if you can get those hit that 20 point barrier, you'll get the point as well. And so you keep it interesting for everybody. Um, so it actually caused us to kind of really come up with some really interesting like mechanics within the game that we've, we haven't seen in other games before, and particularly not in uh, arena combat games. Um, but yeah, I just... Well, typically um, you want to just annihilate your opponent, <laughs> not make them stronger, well, yeah. you want to destroy them. <laughs> but I, I, I think there's this thing quite often, like I'm kind of going back and designing a game. I think my younger self would like to enjoy if they were around now. Right. Or let's be, let's be honest. I'm, I'm quite sure that your younger self is still you. Oh yeah. yeah. <laughs> of, of all it's the sitting in the know. cockpit. It's sitting in the cockpit, like steering me. Um, and, but sometimes I, I would kind of get frustrated because I would say, see people designing a game and they say, you know, they're being inspired by that game they played when they were younger. But when I look at it, I go, but your younger self couldn't play this. It's way too complex or it's too dark. Like your younger self isn't interested in any of this stuff. So are you just designing it for you now? And, and not your younger self. And because then people wonder why people aren't playing the game. Um, and it's like, because you didn't actually design it for the younger you. You designed it for this like notion of who you were. Um, but you've forgotten how you were content with like maybe more luck or a shorter game or less complexity that as an adult, you had to wrap all this extra stuff in. And that's where like we worked really, really hard to make sure, you know, that younger self gets to enjoy this game and have a blast because we created that as the baseline for the experience. Um, and as you play the game, you you kind of like level up. So you gain powers and you get to add in more complexity as you play. Um, but that first experience is like, you know, a 10 year old can open that box and have a blast with it um, without much, much help from adults. Good stuff. Uh I love hearing the the intentionality behind all of this. I I wish uh, I wish all games had that sort of undertone <laughs> that that came came through to uh, be a change change agent. That's definitely a takeaway for me. Yeah. Uh, 
one thing we want to do before we uh, before we wrap things up is just mm. throw a couple of rapid fire questions at you here. Oh, no. I thought uh, I was going to avoid that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and on hidden roll, and one of the things we do have is uh, we it's not a story cube, but we do have a die that uh, mm. just going to roll, and it's going to generate a couple of quick random questions. And um, if uh, the first thing that I guess pops into your mind. Uh, again, no wrong answer, but just uh, okay. A couple, of, just a couple of simple questions around games. So let's let's see what we got, Branson. Oh, we've ooh, what do we got? The broken heart. Uh, so there are games out there that sometimes we love to hate. <laughs> <laughs> what genre of games do you just you know love but hate? Kind of all at the same time. <laughs> oh well, there's ones that I hate are hidden traitor games. <clears throat> because I cannot lie. Like, I will just, like, <laughs> flush, and people laugh at me, because even I try to, like, because I'm so bad at lying, I'll try to, like, double bluff. And there was one game of Werewolf where my, my friend was like, like, why did you do that? That's so obviously the wrong thing to do, that you're, you are you must be, like, the 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 werewolf. And I was, I was, like, genuinely going, no, 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 I didn't. Like, I was trying to double bluff to make it so obvious that I wasn't, <laughs> like, no, 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 we don't we don't believe you. So the whole thing, even when I tried to do it, it backfired. Um, oh, I've played I, you hidden roll game and it's it's really fun to play you because like, you get the murderer and like I, guys, I'm just the murderer, right? <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's hilarious. All right. But I, I hear lying is kind of storytelling, so maybe next time you play a hidden roll, roll a story cube and yeah, that'll yeah, give yeah. you your plot. Well, I, no, in terms of telling a story that has to be plausible, I'm not good at, I'm good at implausible stories. All right, what else have we got here? The lightning bolt. Uh, what genre of games do we need more games? Um, well, drama. You know, that's... Um, we had our first foray into that with Holding On, The Trouble Life of Billy Kerr. Um so that's one I think where play again, it's like playing a game for the experience, not for the winning, um, but for the experience you have in the playing of the, the game. And I think just stuff that speaks to a wider audience. Um, so games that have real world settings and mechanics and aren't about being like, we joke about being the, 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 the best or the most competent, you know, trader, um, so there's a game that has like be the most competent trader. It's not even like be the best. It's just be competent. Um, <laughs> but like you know, traditionally a lot of games are some kind of conquest or like amassing of resources. And the more you know, there's lots of games that have moved beyond that. But I think we can really push the boundaries a bit with that. And um, Scott McLeod, who writes a lot about comics, he kind of really inspired me when he talked about the genre for comics and said, like, there's so much scope for um, different genres that we're actually seeing. Yeah, he wrote this in the 90s, and we're seeing that now, and especially with kind of young adult um, fiction, that I kind of feel like games are at that point now where they're starting to branch out into other territories, but it's very, very early days, and I think there's a huge amount of scope for what can be explored. Oh, that's, yeah. that's brilliant. Uh, the uh, well, holding on with the uh, being, I guess, one of the first uh, games that would be a, a drama. <laughs> that's <laughs> well, I'd say it's one of the first games that uh, has made players cry for the right reasons. <laughs> you know, not out of frustration, but um, <laughs> because of the emotional impact and. Again, like in terms of in intention, I kind of, there's a couple of things. I wanted to create a game that literally would sucker punch players into feeling something. <laughs> uh, I was just like, All I right, wanted to show roll. that. Yeah. One, <clears throat> oh, one more roll. <laughs> and we got the star. Um, <laughs> so your kind of top go-to go -to games right now, if you're just going to, you know, let's say it, you're with me on Valentine's Day and we go out to play, you know, get some donuts and play some games, <laughs> which we've somehow done a lot of New York toy fairs. Uh, what are yeah. your quick grab go-to games? Oh, okay. So if I had to be a quick grab one, um, 
I don't think you can do any better. Well, you can't, but sorry, it, it, up there would be um, there's a game called Songbirds, which I would highly recommend because it's just really easy to teach and kind of deceptive. So a simple card deck and you are trying to score uh, points by how you play cards into a, a five by five grid and score them. But there's a whole like bluffing element and this idea of the last card you have in your hand influences your scoring and it always catches players out because they're thinking, oh, you know, I'll play this really high value card then. And they're like, oh no, I kept the wrong one in my hand, <laughs> which means they score lower as a, as a result. Um, so when I think of playing with maybe, you know, casual gamers or people who don't play many games, that's one I would, I would take out to teach because it's, it looks nice. It's birds. Um, and it gives a really satisfying experience in a short period of time. A you know, gateway. Uh, it, <laughs> In addition, I would plug uh, our own Flip Over Frog and Combo Clash, which are great games to teach people. Like You'll do it in, in no time, and it's lots of fun as well. Awesome. Well, this, is, uh, this has just been wonderful getting to hear yes. the, the origin and the journey of Story Cubes, uh, the intentionality be- behind that, and, uh, and Prism Arena. Uh, for our listeners, where is the best place to find or follow what it is you're working on and doing? Oh, I've, I've kind of gone a bit silent on social media, but you can find me as uh, Rory O'Connor on Twitter, um, Facebook as well. I think I'm Rory O'Connor 74. And our you can find us as We Are Hub Games on pretty much all social media channels from you know, Instagram to uh, kind of YouTube and Facebook as well. Perfect. Yeah. Well, again, thank you so much for the time. Thank you for having me. It's been a lot of fun and um, yeah, hope you enjoy the stories. <laughs> <laughs>